We're continuing our studies in Matthew's Gospel, and this evening we're looking at chapter 13 and reading the first 23 verses. Matthew 13, verse 1. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let, him, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in, paral in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. May God bless to our understanding that reading of his word which we shall look together at, God willing, in a short while. I'm certain I, I, that I stand on solid ground if I make that statement that this passage the parable of the soul will be familiar to many, if not everybody, gathered here this evening. We may not be able to quote the verse by verse, but I'm sure that we would certainly give a, a clear rendition of its content. How many times have we heard you know, somebody standing like this, or maybe even in Sunday school many, many years ago, speaking on the parable of the sower? See, in verses, the first three verses, it says, The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large 
crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables. Indeed, the whole chapter of Matthew 13 is remarkable for the number of parables that it actually contains. And I'm sure we're all aware that there's so many different definitions of what a parable is. Parable can be defined as an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. They are sayings which take common everyday situation and events to explain spiritual truths. Now I would suggest that because of the familiarity and the definition of a parable, there is a tendency, even among believers such as ourselves, it is so easy to desensitize them. Oh, it's, yeah, it's a nice story that Jesus told, and I've heard it so many times, but where it doesn't really have any relevance to this technological age. It doesn't have any real re relevance to my life and the things that are going on there. I would put it to you that the parables are far more than just nice stories. The Lord's teaching in parables clearly shows us that vast eternal division between those who believe and trust in the Lord Jesus and those who will reject him. Sam, could I have the... Well, if I put this up, I suppose it relates to what we're talking about. You'll appreciate that this is a modern picture. I suppose the giveaway is the little lad with his wellies on. Uh, what caught my attention to this and what really attracted me to it was the caption. That what it was, it, it says that this is traditional farming going on in on rocky soil near to Bethlehem. So it fits in to a great extent with what we're looking at. We notice in the passage that there's no mention of ploughing. What we had rather was the sower, the farmer, simply had a bag over his shoulder and he just went around throwing the seed here, there and everywhere. When I was a young lad, well, 14 years old, I was driving tractors all over the place on my uncle's farm, doing all sorts of things, lugging all sorts of um, agricultural equipment with it. And in those days, the tractors would drive, they don't relate anywhere to the technology and the mechanism and the, and the huge things you get behind on the road and you think, oh, I wish you'd turn off somewhere. Um, we've all been there, haven't we? Um, but here, it was the farmer going out to say with his bag and he was throwing the seed here, there and everywhere as he walked along. And so he would have really no control over where the seed went. And so what you see, hence the air is it fell on the path, on the rocky places, amongst thorns and on good fertile soil. And so what we have here is Jesus telling these parables, and particularly this one that we're looking at. And we see in verse 10 that the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak in parables? Well, hang on, what's going on here? Why have we suddenly switched to this method of speaking to the people? And we see what we see in verse 11. He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. In other words, the, the disciples, having been called by the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were privileged. And even though there was lots of things, as we, we see that as you go through the scriptures, they were totally confused about Yet because they had faith and they believed and they were following the Lord Jesus as his disciples, they had that knowledge, that understanding. And this is what we see. This is why I speak in, and then in verse 12, whoever will be given more and they will have an abundance, sorry, whoever 
has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. This is why I speak in parables. Verse 12 can often be a very difficult verse to understand. Well, what's going on there? But simply, Jesus taught the parables so that those with believing hearts, those who looked to him and trusted him, would understand more clearly. And those who rejected his preaching, those with hard and believing hearts, would not understand. The New Living Translation puts it in these words, to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. And if we are believers here this evening, that's what it's all about to a certain extent. If it, see what it says, to those who are listening. And the challenge to each one of us is, are we listening to God's word, to God's voice? From those of us who stand here and physically proclaim the gospel, or whether it's in home groups, or whether it's in our own private devotions at home and our Bible studies, are we just reading the words and then forgetting it? Or are we listening to what God is actually saying to us? See, as used in the scriptures, and appreciate parables can be used in a totally unscriptural situation. But in the scriptures, a parable is an instructive story which is made clear to those whose hearts respond to God, but it is hidden from those whose hearts are hardened towards him. See, Jesus did not st stop people understanding. He used the scriptures we see further on that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And the words he uses are a result of the consequences of people's resistance towards his word. In verse 13, we see, Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. This is why I speak in parables, it says. In verse 14, In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. And then if you go up to verse 35 of, of this same chapter, what we get again, he said, in the parable of the mustard seed, that is, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. And that is actually a direct reference from Psalm 78. Isaiah chapter 6, this is what the Lord is quoting when he says in them, going back to verse 14, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and verse 10. He says, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. If you are keeping up with the big read, and we've just finished Acts, and if you look in Acts 28, you may recall Acts 28 verses 26 and 27, Paul preaching in Rome, what he says, go to this people and say, you will ever be ever hearing but never understanding. You will ever, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. And here again we get this direct quote from Isaiah, this prophecy. 
We've got to go back. We haven't got time to do it by any means tonight. But if you go back into the Jewish history from the time of Solomon, you see this, you can plot this downward tread of Israel, of God's chosen people, getting further and further into sin, further and further and further away from the, the God who had promised to bless them and to keep them. And so you see the responsibility. It isn't God who is actually stopping them and turning them away. He, the, it, is, it is actually happening because they don't want to know. That is the problem. Again, in Acts 28, if you go back to verse 24, and we see here Paul is preaching this the gospel explaining to the people there and we see the consequences so in Acts 28 verse 24 some were convinced by what he said but others would not believe and there is the key you see others would not believe it speaks of people whose hearts are calloused and if you look up there's quite a few different variations of the different of what callous means but it's talking of people who are totally indifferent they don't want to know and so you can apply that to the proclamation of the gospel Jesus here in Matthew is preaching the principles of the kingdom Christ has come the Messiah is here but the Jewish people his people didn't want to know this is why it speaks of them having calloused hearts they were totally indifferent we don't want to know. We just want to go on in our own way. To quote to Christian writers, Dr. Derek William and Dr. J. Packer, in their Bible application handbook, <coughs> what it says is this. Um, the quote from Isaiah 6 is not a prescription in that God says, I will make you never understand, but rather a des description. It is a description of the people whose minds are closed to new ideas. They do not want to discover anything about God which doesn't conform to their preconceived ideas. They are not capable of seeing even if it stares them in the face. God does not want to harden hearts. God himself does not close people's spiritual eyes. He does not hide spiritual truth from people. They are able to hear and see well enough. The problem is that they are, were and are willing, unwilling to listen to God and to look to him. How many times have we sought to give even a simple witness? Maybe it's to unbelieving members of a family, to work colleagues. Maybe to someone we get into conversation with, either in the shop or, or wherever, on holiday. And it isn't long before you see the indifference coming through. Yeah, well, okay. I don't really want to know. They may not actually say that in words, but it is quite clear that that is what is in their minds. Because of willful, persistent, disobedient, hearts eventually become calloused, closed and hardened to God's words. And you see, once people's hearts become hardened by sin, God gives them up to their sin. He gives them over. He lets them go their own way. And a way which leads, sadly, to judgment. But you see, he does this only after warning them, pleading with them. But there comes a time when it is too late to turn back. And again, in Acts 19, we read that Paul, again, preaching the gospel, seeking to make known the truths of the kingdom. In verse 8, it's, sorry, in verse 9, um, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe. And time and time again, it comes back to this situation. Whenever we seek to proclaim the gospel, 
either to a congregation such as this or a crowd as the Lord Jesus did or whether it's just a one-to-one -to, -one to an unbeliever time and time again what happens is it can be said of the person they refused to believe the question is how does the parable of the sower apply to the modern age as we saw before this familiarity so many people yeah it's a nice story that Jesus tells them it's got nothing to do with the new technological age which we live in it's outdated it's old hat there are ways of hearing the truth without it being the better benefit to the listener we can listen to a message or a sermon or even one-to-ones were with our hearts and they're like the trodden path if we are thoughtless and unconcerned as we listen Satan as it says will pluck away what we hear and will go away as if we'd never heard if we'd heard nothing at all I wonder if there's times when we're like that when we come and we sit here under the sound of the word and we go away and we suddenly realize our minds been somewhere else and it's as though we listened we'd heard nothing at all there's many time at home when Jill and I are talking and she'll be saying this and this and this and all of a sudden the tone will change and the words are you are not listening to this at all I well and I'm going to be honest, it's true. <laughs> I'm hearing, but I'm not listening. Um, I can see faces smiling there and thinking, yeah, that's me. So I'm pleased to think it's not just me on my own um, that does that. But this is the problem, you see. We have believe unbelievers coming into our services and sitting and sharing in the fellowship and coming into the activities but they go away and one wonders wow did they really hear that and it's as though they've never heard it at all we can listen with great pleasure and acceptance but it only has a temporary effect upon us we are like the rocky places we may have many warm feelings and emotions about what we have heard. We may even give an appearance of faith. But there is no deeply rooted work in our hearts. And at the first sign of opposition or temptation, it will wither away. Because there is no real root. We've listened, yeah, we've sort of accepted, yeah, that's great, that. Just for me. But as soon as something steps in, someone challenges over it, ooh, it's gone. And we suddenly realize there was no real depth there. We can listen to a message and approve and agree to every word similar to the rocky places, yet no good come will come of those influences. Like the thorny grounds, our hearts can be choked with worldly pleasures and plans yet there is no genuine work of grace in this passage in Matthew 13 verse 22 we see and what is happening the Lord is explaining here to the disciples the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word but then the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. We listen, someone listens, and yeah, that's great, that's for me. But then the pleasures and the pressures of this world come upon us. Notice what, and again, this 
passage in Matthew 13. You'll find, if you want to check it up later at home, you get another repeat version of this in Mark chapter 4. And what it says here, you know, that the... This about the, of, of riches, the deceitfulness of riches and wealth. So the things of the world made, I will drag that person away. How many times have we seen people coming and then suddenly they drift away? And they, they, they're here regularly over a period of time and they seem to be going on well and then all of a sudden it gets less and less and less and less and less and then you don't see them anymore. Because the worries and the pleasures and the things of this world have taken all that, have the upper part. And again, there is no real depth of spiritual understanding. As it says, the, it is unfruitful. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness for riches, the desires for other things come in and choke the word. See, there are many ways of listening to the word of God without it being of any benefit to us whatsoever. The Lord Jesus is speaking particularly about unbelievers, but we can apply it to ourselves as well. As believers, we can indeed. Although, you know, we, our salvation is secure. We can be dragged into all sorts of things and we certainly find we get, seem to be getting further and further away from the Lord. In Romans 8, in verses 7 and 8, it, it says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not sit, submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. But then you see we come to that last bit in the parable. The good ground, the seed falling on good soil, refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. God illumines their heart and wow, they switched on and they understand it. Not only understands it, but they accept it and they believe it. And see, this, this, those are those who through God's grace come in true repentance and faith and go on to bear much fruit. This is the person, the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. And I know many of us, the majority of us, I hope, are in that situation today where we can look back and praise God that we listened. Maybe not to a sermon like this, it may be a word we read. Someone who said a word to us or just a short thing. It is still the seed coming into the good soil and God had prepared our hearts. See, it is only true believers, those who have repented of their sin and live by faith in Jesus, who are capable of producing lasting fruits. If you go through that list and you see for each one, well, it falls on the path, where it falls on rocky places, where it falls on thorns. Each time it, gives, it says it's unfruitful, it falls on deaf ears as it were. There is no real root. It is, as I say, it is only true believers who can go on. Those who have repented, there will still be thorns, but they will not be able to destroy the good work that has commenced. There will be things in our lives which will drag us down and down and if it's not for, were not for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would sink utterly. There will still be thorns, yes, but the evidence of true faith 
and belief is the fruits going on living a life that is holy witnessing testifying to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus to use the phraseology of the parable are there thorns in the soil of our hearts are there besetting sins which we know are holding us back from walking in true fellowship with the Lord sins of attitude or habit which hinder our service for him how we need to continually root them out by God's grace seek his forgiveness and to go on being more and more fruitful finally returning to the statement made right at the beginning the Lord's teaching in parables clearly shows the vast eternal gulf between those who will believe and trust in him and those who will reject him if we go into Psalm 1 and it, and it not just Psalm 1 but it goes right through the Psalms and it continues on in the words of the Lord Jesus through the New Testament and through the Apostles but Psalm 1 contains two images one of the righteous person and one of the wicked consider the righteous person in Psalm 1 it says blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked that person that blessed person that righteous person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers here is a picture of the believer portrayed as a tree and one thing I'm sure if you a gardener of any sorts one thing you learn even if you're not very good at gardening like myself you learn that one thing trees and plants and bushes need is water and they need feeding if you don't give them plenty of water and food they will die but the right the blessed one is like a tree planted by a stream there's a continual flow of water it doesn't rely on somebody coming and tipping a can of water over them then going away and forgetting about them or going away on holiday and you come back how many days or weeks later and you think all oh, your plants have died there is a stream continually the Lord Jesus and God in his mercy if we are his today supplies that continual flowing stream no matter how parched we may seem to get no matter how hard life may seem to be yet that water that stream is still there to sustain us and to keep us but then it goes on not so the wicked they are like chaff that the wind blows away therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous and in Psalm 37 verse 18 the blameless that is again the righteous person spend their days under the Lord's care and their inheritance will endure forever what a glorious verse that is, is it not? If there is a verse we need to remind ourselves continually, day after day, moment by moment, to me that is the one. The blameless, not that we sin free by any means, but the believer then, the believers spend their days, their whole life, under the Lord's care and their inheritance will endure forever and again in 30, Psalm 37 and verse 38 but all sinners will be destroyed there will be no future for the wicked God has spoken and so we see this is the parables Jesus speaks and shows those who believe 
those who have understanding can understand those who are hearts are callous who have no interest who do not want to know will not believe In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and he presents him with a potted history of Israel's history. And in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 11 and 12, Paul writes, These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the communication of the ages has come the culmination well, I can say it rather of the ages has come and he ends with this so if you think you are standing be careful that you do not fall we need to make sure our faith is real that it is not unfruitful the rocky places the path the thorns all those options were false. There was no genuine depth. It was just the good soil. We need to make sure our faith is real, that our heart is indeed the good soil.